Michael Morris, superintendent of the Amherst Public Schools, and thank you for viewing the latest edition of Window into ARPS. For today's episode, we're going to be focusing on the Fort River Feasibility Study. And with me today are Jonathan Salvin, who's the chair of the Fort River Feasibility Committee. So thank you for being here, Jonathan. And Richard Sipic, who is a partner at TKSP, TKSP Studios, excuse me, uh, who has been partnering with the town uh, to work on this feasibility project. So thank you both for being here. Um, yeah. I know this is an interest of high, uh, a topic of high interest in our community. Uh, so really, I look forward to hearing from both of you and sharing my own perspectives to really talk about the work that's happened, the work that will be continuing over the next couple of weeks, and how this informs the larger effort of the town to um, improve the education for our students. Mm -hmm. So before we get into uh, more on the feasibility study specifically, I wonder if you could just share a little bit about yourselves, sure. you know, your background and how you got connected to this project. And I'm happy to start with you, so, Jonathan. Uh, as you said, I'm Jonathan Salvin. I'm the chair at the moment. Um, I'm also a Fort River parent. Um, we have two boys uh, in kindergarten, one in kindergarten, one in the third grade. Um, and uh, we've lived in the community for about uh, 12 years now. Um, and I, I am also an architect, like Richard, but I'm not the architect for the project. Um, but I, I am a partner at Cute and Riddle Architects here in town. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, my name is Richard Zivak, and I'm a partner in TSKP Studio, and uh, we have offices in Boston as well as in Hartford. Um, our firm is a regional firm. We've done educational work for a long time. Um, personally, I <clears throat> started my architectural career in 1974, having finished architecture school, which interestingly is around the time that Fort River was built. <laughs> Um, and so during my career, I've seen a lot of changes in school design and school construction, uh, including retrofitting schools that are of the Fort River vintage. So I'm very familiar with the building. Uh, I'm very familiar with the process of school design and school construction. And uh, I've been working with the Feasibility com Committee now for several months and uh, would be happy sh to share my thoughts with you uh, on that project. Great. Thank you so much. So before we get to the neat diagrams that you brought to show uh, mm -hmm. the community, I think maybe just having some background information uh, on the purpose of the committee and the work that's happened would be really helpful. So I wonder, Jonathan, if you could start a little bit with the purpose and then we can, we can talk about the work that has occurred and then get to actually see the work that's occurred, which is, um, of course, high interest for our community. So our committee was uh, created uh, by town meeting in, I think, March of 2017. Um, we've been meeting as a group since October of 2017 um, and before hiring Richard um, we also uh, went about uh, doing some air quality testing um, we've done a site survey we've done some geotechnical work or geotechnical testing um, so we've done some work in addition to working with with TSKP uh, during that that time great and do you want to add some about the work since you've been on board? Sure. Um, well, we've uh, been working now for several months, and we don't work alone. We bring in uh, the appropriate specialists and consultants that help us assess the existing physical conditions and then help us in projecting the possibilities, some options, as well as cost. So working with us is LIM consultants. They're structural experts. They've gone through the existing building. Cole Aronin, they're the mechanical electrical plumbing experts and they've gone through the building as well. Um, Berkshire Design Group, local firm, uh, they're experts in civil and landscape and they've gone through the building and the site and have done some assessment. In addition to that, the town has hired a surveyor to survey the site as well as a geotechnical engineer to do a geotechnical analysis of uh, subsurface conditions. So all of those experts participate in writing a report, which we're in the process now of compiling and delivering to the committee. Uh, and we expect to have that done in March, uh, in this coming month. Our role as, as the committee uh, will be to, obviously, once we everyone agrees that we're at the final stage, is to then take that and present that to the school committee. Yeah. And at which point, our committee kind of sunsets, and we don't, we don't go beyond that. We, I did bring some slides, which at the appropriate time, I'd like to share some images from some of the study that we've done. Uh, if I went through all of the study <laughs> details, we'd be here for a long time. But I just brought some sample images to share with you and the audience. 
Fantastic, and right. we'll, we'll get there in a second. Um, I think that uh, I'm trying to whet the appetite perhaps of the viewer because I know those images may be more interesting than looking at the three of us, but um, I think it's also important to note um, as an ex officio member um, to share the range of options. Um, by range, I'm talking about types of construction, but also school size, and maybe if you could describe a little bit of um, the varied approaches and the, var and the kind of range of data that we're collecting as part of this project, it might inform the viewer and, and inform the kind of the viewing of the slides. Mm -hmm. Well, we looked at uh, the base option, which is basically just bringing the building up to code and not doing any improvements from an educational standpoint. Um, and then we looked at completely replacing the existing building with new construction, and we looked at a various range of additions and renovations, perhaps some addition and some renovation to various degrees. So we actually studied uh, quite a number of options, including population options. Um, a smaller population to po perhaps a K6 only, perhaps a K6 with pre-K. Uh, and so we actually, in our study, you'll see, went to the upper limit because you could easily scale back. But if you look at the upper limit, then you can kind of get a sense of what the, the possible um, possibilities might be. So we, I, I will share with you later the upper range, which is 465 pupils. That's 420 pupils in the K-6 um, grades and then another 45 in the pre-K. And some of this was guided by trying to model the process that you would have to go through if it were, were in fact an MSBA, Massachusetts State Building School. Authority. Can't never get school that building right. authority, yes. Thank you That's for project correct. funded project, <laughs> which we're not. Um, and we should be clear about that, that this was, this was set up kind of between um, the Wildwood process and some future process. But we wanted to model um, the, the work of the study with that in mind so that we were providing data that was um, of the same quality and the same breadth, I guess I'd say. That's correct. We, we actually did talk to, with the committee about what do we use as the standard for planning. I mean, there's different standards you can use in terms of square footage you know, for population, depending upon age range, and what I think the consensus of the committee was, well, let's use the MSBA guidelines. Not that it's an MSBA project, but just as a, a tool to compare square footage with what MSBA might, might view. Absolutely, and stepping slightly out of the role of, of interviewer uh, for a moment, I think one of the things that's important to note is what's incredibly beneficial from my perspective is that when the request was made um, for the feasibility study, it's really to gather a significant amount of information that we didn't currently have at that time. So it was going to inform any future project that occurred, and that was both about the site, as you noted, uh, about the building, about options to address some of the deficiencies in the infrastructure. Right. And so what I'm incredibly appreciative of, of the work of the committee, but also of, uh, of your work and your team's work, is we're collecting, it's almost like a treasure trove of information that whatever future project the town ends up wanting to support to improve the education of our students, we now have a um, tremendous amount of data that you know, was really just conjecture beforehand. Correct. And I was asked by members of the public at a public uh, meeting whether that they could extrapolate from the information in our report. And then let's say you change the population or you change the square footage. Can you use this in a direct ratio? Well, not a direct ratio, yeah. but because you have to actually delve into it a little bit. But you can, you can extract from it and then make a pretty intelligent guesstimate of different scenarios. Yeah. Yes, so it's very useful. Absolutely, and the site certainly, you know, which I know we'll, we'll speak to when we start looking at the slides, is a question that many people have had. So having the geotechnical work right. uh, and the borings and all the work that you've done, how would you address it in an ad, you know, the, the current structure in an ad reno model, just incredibly useful um, mm -hmm. because I think it, it really gives us hard data by which in the future to make decisions on as a community. And, you know, from my perspective as someone whose job is basically to advocate for students, it makes it much easier to advocate once we have, you know, this hard concrete data to um, base our advocacy on. So, right. Right. Um, so why don't we get to slides? Um, you know, so I think I'll turn it over to you, Richard. Um, and I know uh, for the viewers, the 
kind of what Richard's describing will show up on the screen. Okay, I, I did print out a copy of the slides for my benefit, <laughs> so I may be referring to my paper here momentarily, but I think if you refer to slide number two, uh, which, will, which highlights really the primary goals of the feasibility study, which was to answer two questions primarily. The first question is, is the site buildable? Can you in fact build a building on the site? And the second question is, what are the options? If you were to build, how would you approach it? The answer to the first question I'll answer right now, yes, the site is buildable. In fact, you've had a building on it for many, many years. So that alone is evidence that the site is buildable. Um, we had raised questions early on about the nature of the subsurface conditions. We could tell just looking at the mapping information that it's probably in a riverbed area. Uh, we knew historically that the site was probably farmland at one point. Um, so we, we did have some concerns, and that's why when the question of geotechnical exploration came up, we encouraged that to occur because having done work in riverbed areas before, all of Hartford, for example, is in a riverbed area, um, building a one-story building is technically not difficult. Building a two-story building might be, and it might, you might have to build with piles in order to be able to create a solid foundation. Well, I'm happy to report that based upon the geotechnical information that we don't need piles, but we do need to prepare the soil, and that preparation might be um, basically stones, stones in, placed within the excavated area in order to create a broad enough base that is stable to support a two-story building, which wouldn't be a problem. So the answer to the question, is it buildable? Yes, it's buildable. There have been some questions raised about the high water table, uh, about the dampness in the existing building. Um, all of that is uh, easy to solve in new construction. It's done all the time. The existing building was not built with a vapor barrier or even insulation under the existing slab. So a lot of the dampness could be coming from the hydrostatic pressure that's from the high water table penetrating, or perhaps just condensation that's occurring because the existing building is inadequately ventilated. When you have humid air in the building, that humid air, when it reaches a, a colder area, like the floor slab, which is built right on the ground, which is not insulated, you're going to get condensation occurring. So that won't be a problem in new construction with adequate ventilation, with proper vapor barrier separation, and so on. So the answer to the first question is yes, the site is buildable. And it's buildable in a number of different locations adjacent to the existing building. The second question that was posed is what are the options? And there are many options. And I would like to focus maybe just on a handful of them. So if you go to page, or if you go to slide number three, which is an aerial <coughs> photograph of the existing Fort River School, you'll see that the white rectangular area is the roof of the existing building. And you can see within that area, there are a number of holes. Those holes are uh, courtyards. They're very small courtyards. There are a total of seven small courtyards. Um, and I think to call them courtyards is kind of a generous term. <laughs> um, and there's one larger one, which is near the cafeteria area, but the smaller courtyards really are nothing more than light wells. In an effort to create some daylight within the classrooms that are not on the perimeter of the building, and consequently they don't have windows that are on the outside of the building, that have a view of the outside of the building. So there was a, it was a small attempt to create that, and uh, they are woefully inadequate, in my opinion. But anyway, the existing building is a one-story building. It's built on a conventional spread footing, um, and it has uh, on, and north, I should point out, in this picture is to the left of the image. So on the um, west side, or just below that white rectangular area representing the building, you'll see some parking area, you'll see a bus drop-off area. And then on the opposite side of that rectangle, you'll see pl play fields and playgrounds. The existing building is uh, 78,000 square feet, which is not adequate for what you need to satisfy the building program that you're proposing, that 465 pupil range. 
by our estimate, again, using MSBA as a guide for square footage, we believe you need to about 85,000 square feet uh, properly partitioned with separate <laughs> classrooms that don't have uh, uh, that that don't have internal courtyards that have proper exterior windows that have proper acoustic separation, 85,000 square feet. So that's important to remember. Um, so why don't we talk about uh, further answering the question about those options? If you go to slide number four, you'll see that there's a range of options illustrated in that slide. Everything from A through F. This is only uh, six out of 147 options that we looked at, but I, they are a pretty good sampling of the range of possibilities. On the left, you see building a new building. That's option A, 85,000 square feet, or 100% new construction. And on the right, you see option F, which is keeping only the existing 78,000 square feet building, 0% new construction. Um, and then in between A and F, you see various possibilities. A two-story addition, a one-story addition, two small separate additions, and then one small separate addition. Now if we go to the next slide, slide number five, this is a, uh, this is a view, an aerial view of one possibility. It, it's a new two-story building built just to the south of the existing building. And you'll see a lot of little rectangles, little dark rectangles on top of that blue shape, which represent photovoltaic panels. I'll get into that in a moment. But if you go to the next slide, slide number six, which is a diagram that illustrates the existing footprint of the building, existing building, which is a one-story building. You can see the little uh, courtyards. And then on the right of that is a two-story footprint of a new building uh, in blue. So you can see comparatively the existing versus new footprints. And uh, I placed the new building approximately where we'd, we could build the new building uh, adjacent to the existing footprint. So that's option A, building a completely new building. Now if you go to slide number seven, you'll see a site plan that illustrates that same footprint in orange and it has these pink rectangles on the roof that represent solar panels. Actually, you'll see a lot of pink rectangles <laughs> on that site plan. They all represent potential photovoltaic systems. Um, so let's back up a minute. One of the things that we're aware of is a bylaw in the town pertaining to net zero construction. That bylaw says that for new construction, you need to build a building that is net zero. In other words, you're not having to buy energy. You are generating energy on the site so that you don't have to buy any. How do you do that? Well, you can do it through wind turbines. If you're near the shore, you can use <laughs> tidal and waves to generate electricity, but neither of which are practical for this site. Only, the only on-site generation of power electricity is through photovoltaics. So how many photovoltaic panels do you need to generate net zero energy building use? Uh, what you see here is approximately 6.4 million dollars worth of photovoltaic panels which you would need to place on the site in order to meet the net zero requirement provided that you are achieving an energy use intensity of 50. So people who um, study energy use in buildings, um, measure energy in terms of energy use intensity. Just to put this in perspective, the typical building today is about an energy use intensity of about 100. You can easily achieve an energy use intensity of 50, which means you're using less electricity, less um, gas or oil for heating, you're using less for ventilation because you're making a tighter building, for example. And that's what you would have to do anyway to achieve uh, compliance with energy codes, as you know. So to achieve an energy use intensity of 50, 
you need approximately $6.4 million worth of photovoltaic panels on the roof. And the site. And the site. That's, that's correct. That's a good point, Jonathan. It's not only photovoltaic panels on the building roof, but it's also on the site as well, whether it's out in a field or whether it's over parking stalls in the parking lot. There's another strategy you can take, which you reduce the energy use intensity. If you go to slide number eight, you can see much fewer um, photovoltaic panels on the site. Now it's only on the building and on the parking areas over parking stalls. And how do you achieve that? Well, you reduce the energy use intensity of the building down to 30. And you, how you do that is by increasing the insulation in the building, perhaps going to triple glazing in the windows, perhaps only using a portion of the building during the summertime. That's how you achieve it. You also could use techniques like automatically turning off power outlets because power outlets drain energy um, even though you may have turned off your computer if you leave something plugged in it still is draining power and so if you have a method of turning off electricity to those outlets automatically you can reduce your energy use intensity so this illustration on this slide shows uh, fewer photovoltaic panels uh, in fact you reduce your photovoltaic cost to 3.8 million However, you do need to uh, do other kinds of energy um, systems, mechanical systems, like you might use geothermal. You might have uh, geothermal wells, for example, on the site. So we would budget another $1.4 million for that. And then you'd have to improve your envelope of the building, your roof and the walls and the windows. So that premium would be an additional 2.5. So the total premium to achieve net zero in this scenario would be 7.7 .7 million. Does that make sense? It does, okay. yeah, no, absolutely. So we have about five minutes left of, of, of uh, film time. So um, I think it's an important point. I'm glad you raised the net zero because there's certainly a lot of questions that in our community around that since it's a new bylaw and there hasn't been a project that has been built since that bylaw or even designed since that bylaw has been passed. This is really helpful for the community to see that. Um, I wonder if we could transition sure. to some of the ad reno. Sure. Models. Why don't we jump to um, slide number um, 17, which illustrates the same range of options A through F, but you'll see in the chart there we've added duration of construction. Because depending upon whether you build new, uh, completely new, whether you're renovating and adding on will change the duration of construction. If you change the duration of construction, that adds cost to things like uh, general conditions, um, things like trailers on the site, superintendent time, insurance duration. Uh, so you can see here in option A, which is the 100% new option, that is the shortest duration of construction, only 22 months of construction and you can occupy the existing building without disruption during that period. And the longest is options D and E because renovation work is going to be complicated. You're going to have to vacate a portion of the building or consolidate activities in a certain portion of the building while you're grabbing that portion and doing selective demo and selective renovation in that and then you're hopscotching around the existing building in order to achieve full renovation. That's uh, anticipated to be 36 months of construction. And I should point out in option E, which has the smallest addition, probably will need some swing space, some portable space. Um, not classrooms necessarily, but perhaps for admin areas or other kinds of support spaces in order to create the swing space that you need to vacate portions of the building as you renovate. So this diagram illustrates the range of construction duration. The last slide I want to show, share with you is slide 18, which shows the range of costs for these options. So you have um, $63.3 million for option A down to option F, which is $28.3 million, but option F doesn't address the educational requirements that there's no addition and you still will end up with open classrooms right. with courtyards for token daylighting, quite frankly. Um, 
I also want to point out that these costs represent total project costs. Now, when you talk to people about construction projects and costs, very often you're getting apples and oranges and trying to compare them. I want to make sure you understand that this includes all construction costs or renovation costs, if applicable. It includes all uh, engineering soft costs, it includes furniture and equipment, it includes abatement and demo as appropriate, and it includes uh, furniture and equipment and contingency. So that's all in. Thank you. And I think for the viewers who are, who are seeing these images, this is really the data that you know was asked for and was requested and will be incredibly useful as the town figures out its next steps uh, in terms of MSBA and, and what it chooses to do moving forward. So um, it's incredibly helpful. Um, I like that you started with the two questions of, you know, is, it, is the site buildable and what are the options? And that's really the core questions that the community had on the front end and the fact that we're coming out with kind of uh, clear answers and information uh, to inform the town's next steps is just incredibly useful, incredibly important, and you know, uh, I'll just speak for myself, as someone who is, uh, whose job it is to advocate for students, it's really exciting to think about what possibilities may be out there um, now that we have this information, um, and hopefully it really contributes to the community moving forward and the way it chooses to move forward um, about how to improve the condition of the building. Um, I also want to note that I appreciate that the process, both the committee and then the, the consultants, have really identified um, what I think was you know, discussed loosely about the challenges at Fort River and put a very scientific, technical point to it. Um, it's very, very helpful um, to have that perspective to better understand the current conditions of the site and the building. Members of the committee have been great, by the way. Um, they read everything that we write. They question everything <laughs> we write. In fact, even just a day or so ago, we received a, a group of questions from Jonathan saying that, oh, you need to answer these additional questions. Yes. So that's, again, that's part of the process. Yeah. And uh, we intend to finish up this, the coming month in March. And this information will become available through the committee, I imagine. Great. Well, we do need to close the show. Uh, but thank you both for your spending time here, sharing with the community the perspectives on the work of the Feasibility Committee and, uh, and also the detailed images and the work of your firm. So. Thank you very much, and we'll be Thank back you. again soon with the next episode of Window and Arps. Thank you.